This program is rated PG. It contains themes and scenes which may not be suitable for very young audiences. Parental guidance is advised. Be advised that the views and opinions of the hosts and guests do not reflect those of the station. Hello and welcome to the COP23 website. This year's COP23 UN Climate Change Conference is incredibly important. For the first time, a small island development state, the Republic of Fiji, will preside over the conference, highlighting action by countries on the front lines of climate impacts. The momentum that has carried us to this point shows no signs of stopping. The rules of the Paris Agreement will be written. Businesses, investors, cities and regions already acting on climate change will share their stories. Youth and civil society's voices will join the chorus of those calling for change. There is no better place to advance work towards a bright new future than Bonn. Bonn is emerging as the sustainability hub with UN international agencies and international institutions working on issues from sound environmental stewardship to sustainable development and a resilient global economy. We are delighted to host COP23 here with generous and kind support from the government of Germany and the city of Bonn. This support will bring thousands of people together in first class facilities and it will make it as easy as possible for everyone to follow to COP23 online. We hope you join us in Bonn in November. And if you cannot make it, we hope you stay engaged as the UN climate talks move forward. The UN in Bonn is shaping a sustainable future and we want you to be part of it. So follow us on social media, check this site often and get engaged with your country's action to contribute to the Paris Agreement. Together, we can transform the world in ways that are good for the people and good for the planet. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Global Village. I'm your host, Buddy Kunanan. Now, in this show, we talk about everything under the sun, specifically with regard to international affairs. We bring you all around the world. You visit interesting places and meet amazing people. And we also talk about topics and issues that impact the global community. Now, tonight is a very interesting show and a significant one at that because in a few days' time, it will be starting in Bonn, Germany, the Conference of Parties, the 23rd Conference of Parties, that will bring together stakeholders from all around the world, from the academe, from the private sector, from the government, to help address and find solutions to this looming crisis, the greatest threat to our existence as a species. I'm talking about none other than global warming and climate change. So tonight, uh, to talk about uh, COP23, or Conference of Parties 23, and the Manila Declaration, a very significant uh, undertaking by Filipinos, is uh, our two special guests. We have Ray Gorin, and he is a climate finance specialist and uh, lead convener of the Climate Smart Network. Joining him is Mr. Roberto Bresola, and he's president of CREST, the Center for Renewable Energy and Sustainable Technology. Mr. Gorin, Mr. Bresola, good, good evening. Huh? Good evening. Welcome to Global Village, and uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. And, you know, this topic is something I, I really like to talk to my viewers about because, you know, as I mentioned, uh, there's no bigger threat to us all as a species than climate change and global warming. And uh, to start the conversation. Let's talk about your background, gentlemen. Let's start with Mr. Versola. Well, I'm an electrical engineer by training, but I've been active in many social issues, specifically uh, environmental issues. So my current work involves uh, renewable energy. Mr. Versola, what is CREST? It's interesting. Center for Renewable Energy and Sustainable Technology. It's a non-profit and we focus mostly on, uh, on uh, local governments to help them shift to renewables as their energy source. Very good, very good. Mr. Gurin, on your, on your end? Yeah, I'm a climate change specialist and I 
do double into uh, climate uh, mitigation, adaptation, and finance. And I've been doing this since uh, 2003, where I used to work with the Development Bank of the Philippines, and I introduced them the uh, climate change mitigation and ad adaptation facility, one of the first uh, climate finance facilities as early as 2003. So presently, I just do consulting on the climate for, uh, uh, example, Asian Development Bank, uh, United Nations Environment, and uh, prior to that, I was into uh, uh, carbon finance or carbon markets in support of the, uh, what you call the clean development mechanism way back in 2006, 2007, 2010. Quickly, what is climate finance? It's an interesting word, and I'm sure our, our, our audience would love to learn more about this. What is it about? Okay. Huh? Essentially, climate finance is a, is a field of specialization where you try to raise or co-financing to support climate mitigation and adaptation projects. So when you speak of climate uh, mitigation projects, these pertains to projects that would uh, lead to the uh, either reduction of uh, avoidance or sequestration of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So these could be the typical projects like renewable energy, energy efficiency, uh, smart, uh, climate smart agriculture, uh, low carbon transport, and the like. The other side of the coin is the uh, uh, adaptation uh, projects. No? And when you speak of adaptation, that pertains to building uh, resilient cities, communities, uh, investment, infrastructure, uh, built infrastructure, or uh, what you call maintaining these uh, ecological resources. No? But in the context of adaptation, you have to have uh, the context of vulnerability for these uh, components. No? And you have to identify what the specific uh, uh, intent that you need to do to address that vulnerability and the kind of action that you want to do to address that. No? So those are the elements like uh, in, uh, in uh, climate adaptation. No? So it's different from a typical business as usual developmental project compared to uh, an adaptation project. Yes, yes. So by way of an example, if you just build, if you just plant, uh, for example, if you build a road and uh, there is no vulnerability context to like uh, uh, extreme rains and so on, then that's a business as usual project. No? But if a component of a road, a segment of a road is at risk to like storm surges, then you build uh, protection measures to address that storm surge in case of like uh, extreme uh, Cat 5 events, then that is a potential adaptation project. No? It's basically that. helping us uh, live with this reality that we're facing, no? changing weather and change, extreme weather at that. No? And an interesting Mr. Versola that uh, Mr. Gurian mentioned the word vulnerable because we in the Philippines have been, yeah, I mean, we're recognized together we're with, with other island countries as one of the most threatened and vulnerable to climate change. What is, this, what is the situation here today? Well, for instance, uh, the, the, the rising uh, sea levels, uh, they say that, the experts say that the Philippines is about three times more vulnerable. Like, uh, for example, if it ri rises one meter in other places, in the Philippines it will be three meters. So, or, or so, so we, in that sense, we are even more vulnerable. We, of course, across the path of uh, many typhoons, so regularly, yes, we, yes. Uh, I, they say that Yolanda is becoming the new normal, meaning that we'll be having more of Yolandas in the future, just and like the US. And it's not just about strong s uh, storms, it's also about extreme heat, extreme uh, yeah. you know, dryness. Yeah. You know, which are we, we are an agricultural country, and that is uh, a, a, you know, that like bearing on our, our key industry. Yeah, that's true. So Philippines essentially, as mentioned, uh, you're vulnerable to the climate change and variability of like uh, precipitation, or in, in our case, rain, and uh, changes in temperature. And one of the, the, uh, the other things like the, uh, uh, the extreme events, no? like Cat 5 storms, the Yolanda, the Pepe, and uh, the Indoy. So we're vulnerable to that. And this would impact, say, different sectors no? in different locations. Like uh, it could impact uh, agriculture, as you mentioned. Uh, in case of drought, no? that, that prolongs. It affects your water resources. No? Uh, it also affects energy, especially if you're reliant on, say, example, hydropower yes. sources. No? So you, may, uh, you should do what you call an assessment whether the, those water resources would be available to sustain your, example, hydropower generation in the future no? uh, if you're vulnerable to these things. No? Yes. Now, we, we mentioned um, the Manila Declaration, which is essentially a statement coming from pretty much all the stakeholders involved in addressing these concerns of you gentlemen and people finding solutions. What is, the middle, what, what, what is the substance behind the Manila Declaration? Okay, the Manila Declaration is essentially a, um, a national roadmap no, by which to address the um, low carbon climate resilient development of the Philippines. No? It is supportive of what you call the uh, Climate Paris Agreement that the Philippines signed in May. So 
in the uh, uh, Paris Agreement, they, they, you have what you call the nationally determined contributions, and they have two components, mitigation and adaptation, and that is being cascaded down to the different sectors of society, you know, transport, energy, all the way down to health. So the question now, how do you meet those targets on mitigation, like 70% reduction by 2030? Let's, uh, let's make clear, 70% reduction in what? Uh, baseline uh, emissions are using, I think, uh, 2,000... Uh, 20 to 2030, you know, yeah. you need to reduce uh, uh, emissions using uh, from a baseline of uh, no interventions. No, uh, from from if, if I may yeah, explain please, further, please. Uh, we have to project uh, based on a business as usual scenario how our fossil consumption will go up, and that production uh, that projection from 2000 to 2030 is called the business as usual scenario. All right, okay, and. Uh, that will be quite high if we go through the business as usual case. I said, I said nothing changes, change everything as it is yes. now, you, given uh, the, yes. the annual so growth. So you look at the year 2000, uh, 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 let's say how much fossil fuel we were consuming, how much were they going up, uh, what was the share of the renewables, and if you project that up to 2030, that's your business as usual scenario. Now, if you reduce that business as usual scenario by 70%, that is our commitment. So what you're saying is a 70% re reduction in fossil fuels, this means, or all renewables. I don't know. Um, no. Fossil fuel, yes, yes. oil, coal, and yes. uh, natural gas, okay. and all those all right. other. It, it's a combination, and remember that target is what you call aspirational target. It's uh, awfully high, 70% so, so, yeah. is huge. But you can look at it from, from this perspective, now because um, if you want to attract resources, mm. whether it's uh, climate finance or technology, you know, that's the way of attracting it. You know, because you have lots of quote unquote uh, opportunities, emission reduction opportunities yes. to be had in Philippines compared to say other countries which they like just peg it at 10 or 20%. This is drastic, so there's a lot of room where it's a way enterprising of companies yeah, can, can play a role, no? Exactly. Oh. So that is to our benefit, no? Because remember, uh, the achievement of these uh, uh, nationally determined contributions, the Paris Agreement, is subject to uh, resources from the developed countries. So that's one way of roping them in uh, our way. Yeah. Actually, but I've done the numbers. It's not really very high uh, because we are looking at projections of the business as usual scenario. Uh, I did the numbers, and in real terms, it means that we have to go back to our 2012 consumption of fossil fuels. So to, uh, to it's now 2017, yeah. and we have already exceeded that 2012 level. If we are able to go back to our 2012 level, then we meet our Paris commitment, which is the 70%. Basically, it means if you reduce by 70%, then you retain only 30%. Okay, let's talk about this Paris commitment, because you yeah. keep mentioning the Paris Agreement, Paris yes. commitment. What is the Paris? What was the Paris Agreement all about? What was essentially what was, you know, okay, agreed upon there? Essentially, in layman, so not sure. layman. Essentially, it's a a way of how to bring down the uh, global temperatures from uh, uh, or maintain, say, uh, two or even one point five degrees. No, because the the study says the science says that if you have an increase in temperature, it wrecks havoc in say the weather and climate uh, uh, systems of of the earth. No and therefore you have all these uh, um, extreme events. Yes. So you need to bring that down because there is a cost to that. You can, you've seen Yolanda. Yolanda was literally wiped out. How big was the impact uh, in terms of business, in terms of GDP, how many provinces were affected, how many people died. Uh, uh, in terms of uh, business, MSMEs, how many were wiped out. No? So that is a reality. That is a cost. So you, you shouldn't just be looking at it from a science perspective, but also from a perspective of like, uh, economic growth or even business you know, yes. in, in that sense. No? So there is a need. So you do climate, you try to address climate change not because of feeling good, CSR, but mainly because of good business management and also because of good uh, uh, compliance with laws. No? The, the Paris Agreement and the Green Jobs Act and, and all the like, they're all related. Yes, yes. Mr. Brissola? Uh, I would add that if people say it will be very expensive to meet our commitment, but then it will be even much more expensive if we went through the business as usual case. So we, we are actually faced with a uh, choice here, uh, uh, whether we go the low carbon path, which will uh, reduce the, the temperature rise, no? or we go the high carbon path, which will is, the, is the business as usual case, and of course, then we face even a more expensive scenario of uh, coping with all these uh, uh, disasters and effects of uh, climate change. Okay, and the Manila Declaration had a very 
positive, yes. very upbeat basically, uh, message, right? Basically, basically we, we were saying that our 70% commitment uh, is actually doable, contrary to what some government agencies are saying, that we must reduce that commitment, we must try to reduce it. And the advantage, as Ray said, of trying to uh, meet that commitment is that it makes us even more qualified to apply for those climate financing. That there's some amounts are being bandied about 100 billion per year. What and are so these forth. amounts that, that, uh, that Mr. Brizola is referring to when you say climate financing yeah. uh, opportunities? Under the, um, the, uh, the, uh, the Paris Agreement, so, uh, in fact, just going back to the COP23, no, I think the next deliverables would be like uh, the implementation guidelines on the uh, Paris Agreement no, and a reporting system on climate finance, climate action, gender action plan, how to create a mechanism that would address loss and damage, uh, and, uh, and, the, and these things, no, or direct access to adaptation funds. No. So going back to the climate finance, no, because the assumption there is that developing countries think or believe that we need resources to adapt. Because it's very expensive, no? So yes. we need technology to bring down our emissions. So it's like a leapfrog techno leapfrogging technology, no? We can't go back to the, like, the situation in the 1800s, no, where we build it up from again. We need innovative technologies, no? Low carbon, uh, 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 energy efficient technologies, no? To move forward. And um, in climate finance, uh, there is a part that we're looking at, no? It's uh, under the Green Climate Fund, no? wherein the target is like $100 billion by 2020, uh, and it should be accessible to all developing countries no, to fund their adaptation and mitigation. To help them needs. make this shift to, as you said, uh, environment-friendly, yes. low-carbon emission uh, yeah. technologies and industries. Essentially to pursue a low-carbon, climate-resilient development pathway. That really is the key to yeah. climate change. It really is about reducing emissions. That's right. it. And and uh, uh, we're not just talking here of climate change, actually, because fossil fuel power plants, they also cause local pollution. Like, I mean, uh, the ho communities that host coal plants, they are not complaining about climate change. They're complaining about the immediate impact of the coal plant emissions on their health, on their yeah. respiratory system, etc. So there are other reasons why we should uh, reduce our consumption of fossil fuels outside of climate, although that's already a very valid reason. We are talking here of reducing local pollution. We're talking here of uh, inviting green uh, technologies and green businesses into the country. We're talking here of more jobs. We're talking of reducing the price of electricity because renewables today are already reaching a point where they can deliver electricity at lower cost than fossil fuel. Yes, it's there so already. So there yes, are many yes. other reasons why we should do this shift to renewables, which is basically what we're talking about when we say a low carbon path. And that would include, for example, in transportation, the shift from, from internal combustion engines using fossil fuels to electric vehicles. Uh, of course, if, if we talk of forestry, it's about uh, reviving our forests, more reforestation, etc. Very nice plans, very nice plans. Uh, uh, these are all doable, actually. These are all doable. I'll get back to you on that, Mr. Versola. Uh, yeah, you were going to say something? Just to add on the, the, Please. Uh, the uh, Paris, uh, Manila tripartite uh, declaration. No? Uh, the uh, bedrock of that is the uh, what we call the uh, Climate Smart Roadmap for Local PPP Investments, no, which was uh, formulated under the United Nations Environmental Program, Green Climate Finance Readiness Program in Philippines. No. I, I managed that program for, for about a year, and we did develop a, a climate roadmap for Philippines. No. So the overall goal was simply to uh, help Philippines no, sustain what we call low-carbon climate resilient development. And the way we intend to do that is to mainstream climate in the decision-making process of stakeholders, government, private sector. So we were focusing mainly on uh, local PPP, uh, local public-private partnerships. No? And there are three strategic interventions that we're looking at. One is the, uh, uh, the policy level, uh, harmonization and convergence of policies. No? Because Philippines has a lot of policies. No? It's, they're all good. We just need to you know, yes. uh, harmonize and synchronize these things. No? Then there is that need for capacity, operational capacity, uh, institutional building. Because we know what we want to do, but can we do it? So there is a need. So there are, there are uh, specific uh, operational measures that need to be integrated in the business processes of government and private sector. And the last is uh, an intervention on accessing climate resources. Because there are many climate finance resources available. The Green Climate Fund, which was mentioned. Then we have the People's Survival Fund, which is uh, you know, already uh, an adaptation uh, uh, fund for Philippines no? uh, uh, as a result of law. So we need to develop uh, project, concept ideas, not to 
uh, in support of mitigation adaptation so that we can access these funds because the only way to get money is that to show them a good project. Yes, yes. And based on the development of these implementation of these projects, we now go back to the capacity. You know, what are the lessons learned? We bring it that into the operations again, then we put it back again as policies. No? So, so that's the process. No? And that is the bedrock of the Manila Declaration, which we want to share at COP23. Very nice. Mr. Guerin, Mr. Rosola, hold on for a second because we paused for a break. When we come back, we're going to talk about COP23. We're going to talk about your role there. We're going to talk about other solutions we have. And you know, questions like, are these projects, are these solutions doable given the realities the Philippines faces? So guys, stick around because more of COP23 and the Manila Declaration and Global Village returns.